Newton improved upon Kepler's laws. Einstein improved upon Newton. There's an aspect of orbital dynamics that we can't characterize without Einstein's special relativity. In 1638, Galileo proposed an experiment to measure the speed of light by observing the delay between uncovering a lantern and its perception some distance away. He was unable to distinguish whether light travel was instantaneous or not, but concluded that if it weren't, it must nevertheless be extraordinarily rapid. The first quantitative estimate of the speed of light was made in 1676 by Ole Romer. He first observed that the periods of Jupiter's innermost moon Io appeared to be shorter when the Earth was approaching Jupiter than when receding from it. He thus concluded that light travels at a finite speed and was able to estimate that light reflected on Io would take 22 minutes to reach the Earth. Christian Huygens combined this estimate with an estimate for the diameter of the Earth's orbit to obtain an estimate of speed of light of 220,000 kilometers per second, 26% lower than the actual value. In his 1704 book, Optics, Isaac Newton reported Romer's calculations of the finite speed of light and gave a value of seven or eight minutes for the time taken for light to travel from the sun to the earth. The modern value is eight minutes, 19 seconds. Newton queried whether Romer's eclipse shadows were colored. Hearing they weren't, he concluded that different colors traveled at the same speed. In the animation, a beam of light is depicted traveling between the earth and the moon in the actual time it would take a light pulse to move between them. 1.255 seconds at their mean orbital surface-to-surface -surface distance. The foundation for Einstein's theory of special relativity was Maxwell's equations, which he wrote 150 years ago. They unified electricity, magnetism, and light. The first equation expresses the view that there are no magnetic monopoles. This simply means that magnets always have a north and south pole. Magnets are always dipoles. The second equation discovered by Faraday shows that a time-varying magnetic field produces an electric field or an electric motor force. If I move this magnet through the coil, it generates a current. This is the basis of electric motors and generators. The third equation is Gauss's law, which expresses that an electric charge creates an electric field. Positively charged particles attract negatively charged particles. Like charges repel each other. Here's a positive charge. You can see field lines emanating outward. Here's a negative field. You can see field lines emanating inward. Here's a positive and a negative, a dipole. The fourth equation is due to Amper and Maxwell. Hans Christian Orsted noticed a compass needle deflected from magnetic north when an electric current from a battery was switched on and off, confirming a direct relationship between electricity and magnetism. He showed that an electric current produces a circular magnetic field as it flows through a wire. Amper is credited with developing a mathematical and physical theory to explain this. Maxwell added a correction to Amper's law. He suggested that the magnetic fields can also be generated by changing a changing electric field. Consider this circuit. The dashed lines on the left represent a battery. It's the source of current. The gap in the circuit on the right represents a capacitor. There's nothing in the space in between. The blue line is a wire conductor. Here we see a current flow. According to Orsted and Amper, the current will create a magnetic field. As the current continues to flow through the wire, it will continue to create a magnetic field. When electrons get to the capacitor plate, they stop. This creates an electric field between the plates. The one on electron on top will repel an electron on the bottom plate, leaving it slightly positively charged. That creates a current that flows down the rest of the wire and completes the circuit. Anywhere there's a current, there's a magnetic field. As the current flows, the negative charges build up, displacing positive charges on the other side, enabling current to flow on the other side. This goes on until the capacitor is charged up. There was no theory that addressed what happened between the capacitor plates. Maxwell suggested that if a magnetic field was generated throughout the wire, it didn't make sense that there'd be no magnetic field between the capacitor plates. He suggested that the changing electric field between the capacitor plates must also be creating a magnetic field. Otherwise, there'd be a gap in the magnetic field. If you were an outside observer, you might not know there was a capacitor in the circuit. All you'd see is current flowing. It follows that there'd be a magnetic field throughout the circuit. Maxwell compiled these four equations into a coherent theory of electromagnetism. 
He realized that a changing magnetic field would create a changing electric field and vice versa. A changing electric field would create a changing magnetic field. Once set up, the fields would self-propagate. He was able to determine the velocity of this electromagnetic wave with two parameters that were embedded within his equations, permittivity and emissivity. The speed he came up with was 299,792,458 meters per second, which was remarkably close to the figure Ole Romer had come up with for the speed of light. Maxwell suggested, based on this, that light was a form of electromagnetic radiation. Here's an animation that demonstrates an electromagnetic wave in one dimension. Physically, you can never do this. They emanate out spherically. These waves are propagated because of a change, a charge moving in a wire along the z-axis. The moving charge means there's an alternating current in the wire. Because the current alternates from going up and going to going down, the magnetic field is always changing. This generates a correspondent corresponding electric field that it too is always changing. These waves go out to infinity. The source at the top is propagating a traveling wave. The wave below is a standing wave. If you're a surfer and you catch a wave, it to you is a standing wave. A supersonic airplane that goes the speed of sound travels along with the sound waves it creates. In this animation, if you're traveling at the speed of the wave on top, it would be a standing wave. It would appear to you like the wave on the bottom. Waves typically need something to propagate in. Ocean waves propagate in water, sound waves propagate in air. In Maxwell's day, the thought was that there was a lumin lumiferous ether that electromagnetic waves propagated in. Two exper experimenters, Michelson and Morley, sought to me measure the effects of the ether. The Earth spins and orbits around the sun. That's enough motion to cause changes in the direction of the flow of the ether. If the theory held, then it should be possible to observe a standing light wave. Their experiment involved splitting light with half-silvered mirrors and then recombining it. If the apparatus were in motion relative to the ether, the returning light would be different than if the apparatus were at rest. They ran several experiments and always got the same result. The apparatus appeared to always be at rest no matter what time of year and no matter what the time of day. This became known as the most famous failed experiment in history. Einstein suggested that standing electromagnetic waves were not possible. No one had ever observed one. The failed Michelson-Morley experiment settled the issue for him. Standing electromagnetic waves were not possible. Any measurement of position, distance, or speed must be made with respect to a reference frame. Galileo concluded that based on, this premise of iner based on his premise of inertia, it's possible to tell the difference between a moving frame of reference that's moving at a constant velocity. It's impossible to tell the difference between a moving frame of reference that's moving at a constant velocity and a stationary one without some outside reference to compare it against. This is referred to as Galilean relativity. Have you ever been on a train at a station that was right next to another train? At some point, you notice the other train moving. Then suddenly, you realize it was you that was moving. In your frame of reference, you felt stationary. The train you were on accelerated so slowly you didn't notice. From your frame of reference, the other train was moving. Someone on that train would have experienced the opposite, that you were moving. Galileo argued that it wasn't that one of you was moving and the other wasn't. The other train was moving relative to you. You were moving relative to the other train. Galileo asserted that both frames of reference were valid. Galileo asserted that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. He described a ship traveling at a constant velocity without rocking on a smooth sea. Any observer doing experiments below the deck would not be able to tell whether the ship was moving or stationary. Galilean transformations, which are mathematical formulas, are used to transform between the coordinates of one reference frame to another. The frames of reference differ only by the constant relative motion between them. According to Galilean relativity, if you conduct an experiment on the train moving at constant velocity, you will get the same results as if you were on the platform. A ball dropped will go straight down. A ball thrown will travel over a distance. If both frames are initial reference frames, meaning that neither are accelerating, there's no preferred frame of reference. An observer on the platform will see the train moving. An observer on the train will see the platform moving. 
This is especially true for spaceships traveling through the vacuum of space. Once Einstein realized that there was no outside reference to compare one's motion, the only thing you could say about these two spaceships is that they are moving relative to each other. If you're on the bottom, the one on top appears to be moving relative to you. If you're on the top, the bottom ship appears to be moving. Observers in each frame of reference can't agree on who's moving. Imagine you're on a ship with a light at one end. If we turn on the light, Maxwell's equations tell us that it will travel 299,792,458 meters per second in a vacuum. Now let's add a second spaceship traveling at some velocity v. We'll turn on both lights at the same time. The light at the bottom traveled 299,792,458 meters per second in a vacuum. How fast did the light wave on top go? A typical Galilean transformation has you add the velocity v to the speed of light, so the velocity would be 299.792.458 plus v meters per second. Imagine you're standing on the shore of a lake, dropping pebbles in the water. Now imagine a bird flies by and drops pebbles in the water at one second intervals. To make this work, imagine that the bird figures out a way to have the pebbles drop straight down so there's no forward momentum with the pebbles. Both sets of waves move at the same velocity. The waves on the right may appear to move faster. The, the waves on the right may appear to move forward. Think of the pebble falling in water, however. It's as if there were four people standing on the shore dropping pebbles straight down. Rather than standing on the shore of a lake, imagine you're pulsing a light in the vacuum of space. You'd observe waves propagating out concentrically like this. Now imagine a spaceship moving at a constant velocity, pulsing a light. Here the electromagnetic waves propagate through space. From your point of view as a stationary observer, the speed of the waves would be a constant 299.792.458 meters per second. It would be as if there were four spaceships at rest relative to you emitting that are a distance apart emitting light waves. In the lake example, the water and shore were a fixed background. If you were to move relative to the lake, the apparent speed of the waves in water would change. In fact, the apparent speed of the water itself would change the same amount. In space, I said there's no fixed background. There are no preferred frames of reference. From our perspective, the spaceship emitting light appears to be moving. From their perspective, we appear to be moving. An observer in a spaceship will experience this. An observer watching a spaceship travel at a fixed velocity would experience this. According to Maxwell's equations, light, which is a form of electromagnetic radiation, propagates at 299.792.458 meters per second in both cases. So in this example, light waves observed by us travel at 299.792.458 meters per second, and this transformation is wrong. Both, both speeds of light in both cases are 299. 792.458 meters per second. This sets up a discrepancy. Let's take our apparatus and flip it so that it's vertical. Here the light is emitted from the bottom to the top. The length is one light second long. This is quite long, 299.792.458 meters to be exact, and in actuality would be hard to construct. It's easy, however, with a thought experiment, so we'll use the length of one light second. It takes one second for the light to reach the top. Now we'll put one light clock in our stationary frame of reference and we'll have the other move at a constant velocity. The beam on the bottom traveled one light, one light second in one second. The beam on the top followed a longer path as observed by us. It appears to have traveled more than one light second in one second. The speed of light is referred to by the little letter c. Let's diagram the path the light took in the moving frame of reference. The height of the light clock is c. From our point of view, c, the speed of light in a vacuum, is constant. So in one second, the light only travels c along the diagonal. From our frame of reference, this is only as far as the moving light beam can go in one second. Going farther would take more time. There's a discrepancy. An observer who's with the moving light clock will see the light hit the top in one second. In our frame of reference, it falls short. In the diagram, there's a right triangle. 
the hypotenuse is C, the base is the velocity V. According to the Pythagorean theorem, the vertical side is the square root of C squared minus V squared. In our frame of reference, that's as high as the light will go in one second. It will not reach the top. We see it fall short in one second. A local observer sees it reach the top in one second. Einstein had to resolve this discrepancy. He either had to modify Maxwell's equations or Newton's. He loved Maxwell's equations. He thought they were elegant and didn't think the solution lay in modifying them. He instead looked at Newton's equation. Displacement is velocity times time. Displacement is expressed in meters, velocity in meters per second, and time in seconds. Modifying Maxwell's equations would have meant changing the velocity of light. That would change the velocity term. Einstein didn't want to do that. The displacement is fixed. And given that Einstein wanted to keep the velocity fixed, the only thing left to modify was time. This was the great epiphany he had when he conceived special relativity. How do we adjust time? We make the local observer appear to be moving in slow motion. It takes the light one second to move diagonally, a distance of C, from our perspective. From the local observer's perspective, the light didn't make it all the way to the top. We saw the light travel a distance of C in a second. We saw the local observer observe it travel a distance of the square root of C squared minus V squared. You'd multiply one second by C divided by the square root of C squared minus V squared to determine how many seconds elapsed for the local observer, and it would be less than one. Physicists don't want to use the square root of C squared minus V squared. Instead, they came up with another formula. Let's multiply the terms under the radical by c squared over c squared. That equals 1. We can then put the c squared in the numerator under the c squared minus v squared. We can put the c squared in the denominator under the c squared minus v squared. We can take c squared out from under the radical. It now becomes c. We can then separate the terms under the radical. The first term, c squared over c squared, equals 1. We'll make that reduction. We can then put the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared in the denominator. Let's call the symbol gamma 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. This is the denominator of the prior equation. This equals c divided by the square root of c squared minus v squared. Hence, the square root of c squared minus v squared is c over lambda. This is a simple algebraic reduction. The amount of time dilation is t times gamma. If we draw the complete path, the light clock travels the diagonal path. If we draw the complete path, the light clock, the light travels, the length of the diagonal path is c times lambda. There's another effect caused by relativity. If you compare a mass in motion within a frame at rest to a mass in motion within a moving frame, as we said earlier, for the moving frame, you observe a time dilation. From your point of view, the time within the moving frame, reference frame, would progress more slowly. Inertia, which is mass times velocity, must be conserved. Einstein knew this. If time slows, then the velocity of the object traveling within a moving reference frame must slow, since velocity is displacement over time. In order to conserve momentum, the de decrease in velocity must be offset by a corresponding increase in mass. That's expressed with this equation. Notice the gamma is in both the numerator and denominator. That shows mathematically that the momentum p is conserved. Velocity is distance over time, time is in the denominator, and it's the time that dilates the special relativity. Hence, the velocity is v over gamma. The mass is from the local observer's point of view, and it must increase by the same factor gamma in order to keep p constant. Hendrik Lorentz was a Dutch physicist and a contemporary of Einstein. He derived the transformation equations to describe space and time that introduced the concept of gamma. Here we plotted gamma. The x-axis is the percentage of the speed of light. You can see that at speeds well below the speed of light, gamma is negligible. It's only significant as you approach the speed of light. Newtonian me mechanics work fine for speeds well below light speeds. At speeds approaching the speed of light, you need the gamma factor. Astronomers discovered an apparent precession in the orbit of Mercury. The Kepler's and Newton's laws didn't explain. Until special relativity, they couldn't resolve it. In the non-relativistic Kepler problem, an orbiting body follows the same perfect ellipse eternally. With Mercury, however, the orbit processed. Mercury's orbit is more eccentric than the other planets. At perihelion, it's moving pretty fast. If you make the adjustments suggested in special relativity, 
the mass of mercury increases at perihelion. That added mass would be plugged into this equation. It results in an added force that accounts for the precession in the direction of the, Earth, of the orbit's rotation. The effect has also been measured in Venus and Earth. A plate Earth, end bodies, co-orbiting, and special relativity are all exceptions to Kepler's laws. Things like varying solar wind have an impact, too. If Kepler's law is held, we can determine future positions of orbiting bodies with his elliptical geometry. The universe is more complex. Even though Kepler's laws don't hold exactly, we still use Keplerian elements to describe orbits. Satellites are far less massive than the Earth, and the perturbations can be characterized with software like Satellite Toolkit. An ellipse is a pretty good approximation and does a good job in characterizing the initial conditions of an orbit. Ten years after special relativity, Einstein developed his theory of general relativity, which characterized gravity. The basis of general relativity is Einstein's equivalence principle. Imagine a ball falling towards Earth. Now imagine a spaceship accelerating at 9.81 meters per second squared that has a stationary ball inside. In both frames of reference, here is what each observer observes. The ball falls in both cases. Galileo suggested that you'd get the same result from kinematic experiments in any inertial frame of reference. That's a frame of reference that is either at rest or moving at a constant velocity. Einstein's equivalent prin equivalence principle suggests then in both these accelerating frames of reference, you'd also get the same results from kinematic experiments. On the surface of the Earth, you'd experience a 9.81 meter per second squared acceleration downward. Likewise, on a spaceship accelerating at 9.81 meters per second squared, you'd also experience a downward acceleration. If you were inside a box with no windows, you wouldn't be able to tell if you were on Earth or in a spaceship. Notice that in the case of the spaceship, the ball doesn't move. It's in its own inertial frame of reference. The ball doesn't fall. The floor of the spaceship moves up to meet it. Since the spaceship is accelerating, the floor moves more rapidly up to meet the ball over time. If Einstein's equivalent principle holds, then the ball falling towards Earth would also be in an inertial frame of reference. An inertial frame of reference implies that no forces are acting on this ball that's falling toward the Earth. This contradicts Newton's law of gravitation. In Newton's mind, he needed a force to account for both the motion of the planets around the sun and balls falling toward the Earth. He felt the change in direction that went along with orbital motion was akin to a ball on a string that is twirled around. It's the force on the string that keeps the ball from going off in a straight line, the direct, which is the direction inertia wants to take it. Newton suggested that gravity was like a string tied to a planet, that a force was keeping it from traveling off in a straight line. For the most part, that analogy holds and allowed Newton to formalize orbital motion based on a central force. Einstein turned that theory inside out. We've talked about the difference between mass and weight. Weight is a measure of acceleration. If you're in free fall, you're weightless. If there were no atmosphere, no air resistance, you'd stay in free fall until you hit the ground. It was Einstein who figured out that an object in free fall is weightless, and he figured this out when he conceived his equivalence principle. It was supposedly one of the most incredible experiences of his life. He understood something for the first time that probably no one else understood. We can confirm this theory of Einstein if we think about how it feels to have a force acting upon us. Newton's laws of motion state that an object either remains at rest or continues to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon by an external force. A force acting on an object is equal to the mass of the object times the implied acceleration. We've all felt acceleration that results from a force. We can feel it acting upon us. We know what it's like to be pushed around. It feels like a push. In a car, when the driver hits the gas, the acceleration puts us in the back of our seats. A braking action propels us forward. Same is true in airplanes. When the plane takes off, you get pushed into the back of your seat, and when it lands, you get thrown forward. If there's too much force acting upon us, it can cause great injury. In free fall, however, we feel weightless. We don't feel any force acting upon us. This is consistent with Einstein's suggestion that a body in free fall is actually in an inertial frame of reference. We don't feel a force in free fall until we either reach a terminal velocity in the atmosphere or until we hit the ground. Drop a delicate teacup. 
it's fine on the way down and doesn't break until it hits the ground. The force we call gravity on the surface of the earth is not the force of gravity pulling us down. Einstein suggests it's the force of the earth holding us up. Hence, objects in free fall really do not, do not really accelerate. Gravity expressed as a force is a fictitious force, like the centrifugal force of a ro rotating body. I said earlier that there were no inertial frames in the universe. That means there's no place where there's no acceleration. Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that if we're in free fall, we are indeed in an inertial frame of reference. We can say that there's no place in the universe where there's no gravity, but we can't say that we feel no that we, but we can't say that we feel acceleration everywhere. What is everywhere in the universe is what's called curved space. We talked about escape velocities. If you were to plot them on a curve, it looks like this. A spaceship at the surface of the Earth must travel 11.19 kilometers per second in order to escape Earth gravity. As the ship gets farther away from the Earth, the escape velocity decreases. This characterizes how gravity diminishes with 1 over r squared. Since gravity is not a force, how should we think of gravity? This curve lends a clue. Imagine the mass of the Earth at the bottom of a well that is shaped just as the escape velocity curve. This analogy is not correct from a kinematic sense, but nevertheless makes the point. If we wanted to travel around the steep part of the well, we'd have to travel very fast. Otherwise, we'd fall in towards the mass of the Earth. If we're farther away from the Earth, the slope of the well is more shallow. We don't have to travel as fast in order to circle the well. In fact, if we travel too fast, we'd careen off to infinity. Imagine a trajectory like this one, where an object approaches the steep part of the well. As it descends, it will pick up speed, whip around, and be kicked out to the shallow part. This characterizes an elliptical orbit and demonstrates that a planet must travel faster when near the planet and slower and farther away. If the planet doesn't go fast in the steep part, it will fall into the bottom of the well. If it travels too fast in the shallow part, it will escape. This two-dimensional analogy is flawed because it's a two-dimensional model of a three-dimensional phenomenon and it assumes a downward force of gravity in order to represent gravity. Nonetheless, it illustrates the point that gravity is more like a curvature of space than a force. Einstein suggests, suggested, what Einstein suggested was that space in the presence of a massive body is curved. Any object with mass distorts space, and he actually referred to the distortion as a curvature of space-time. Gravity is thus purely is thus a purely geometric consequence of the properties of space-time around a massive object. Gravity in general relativity is described in terms of curved space-time. Matter tells space-time how to curve, and curved space-time tells matter how to move. When a body in motion moves through space-time, it takes the shortest path. If you've traveled long distances on the Earth, you've traveled over routes that are geodesic. On Mercator projection, like the one on the left, it might seem that the shortest distance from Los Angeles to Tokyo is right across the Pacific Ocean. On a globe, however, it's easy to tell that the shortest path takes you higher to the north. Curved space-time follows the same principle. Planets, when they orbit, do not want to go in straight lines. They want to follow the shortest path through curved space-time. The flight route on the right goes along, geodesic, along a geodesic. Same goes with planets moving in space-time. If space-time affects the motions of planet, then Einstein suggested that it would affect the propagation of ele electromagnetic waves as well. This includes light. Einstein needed confirmation of his theory of general relativity. He published general relativity in 1916. Three years later, there was a total solar eclipse. During a total solar eclipse, the light from the sun is obscured, allowing you to see stars that are very close. Sir Arthur Eddington and his colleagues measured their locations. Say there was a star depicted by A behind the sun. In this diagram, you can see the light from star A traveling around the sun through curved space-time. An observer will actually see the star at location B. Sure enough, when Eddington measured the location of known stars, they appeared offset. A star that he knew should have been at location A actually appeared to be at location B. This result was spectacular news and made the front page of many major newspapers. It made Einstein and his theory of general relativity world famous. There's another effect that general re relativity predicts. Gravitational time dilation. 
If you had an observer at the surface of the Earth and another at medium Earth orbit, their clocks would not stay synchronized. Time would dilate for the observer closer to the center of mass of the Earth. Imagine an electromagnetic wave emanating from the surface of the Earth straight out into space. If light waves are deflected as they pass through a gravitational field, they must be elongated as they attempt to get out of a gravitational field. Light that was blue at the surface will shift into the redder part of the spectrum on the way out. Let's say the observer at meteor Earth orbit counts the wave crests of this light wave in the picture here and compares it to his clock. Let's say one wave crest passes every second. On the surface, the wave crests pass quicker, let's say every half second. An observer on the ground would have to count the passing of two wave crests before a second elapsed. The observer in medium, medium Earth orbit looking in sees the wave crest passing every second and only sees the surface observer's clock advance a half second. From the perspective of the observer in medium Earth orbit, the clock on the surface is going slower, only half as fast. If the observer on the surface were to look up at the observer in medium Earth orbit, the clock in orbit would appear to be going faster. This phenomena is demonstrated with the GPS constellation of satellites. They orbit at a circular medium Earth orbit at an altitude of about 20,000 kilometers. Remember from special relativity that time will dilate on the satellite due to the velocity of the orbital motion. The gravitational effects do the opposite. From our perspective on Earth looking up at GPS satellites, the clocks run faster. Velocity dilates time and less gravity speeds up time. Which phenomena dominates? For GPS, is gravity. Accurate time is vital for navigation. GPS satellites have very accurate atomic clocks on board. In order to stay in sync with clocks on the ground, they have to be slowed down. There's a wonderful comic strip, XKCD, by Randall Monroe. He warns you that some of its content contains strong language. None of this does, but if you go there, just beware. What I'm showing you here... Um, he, what I'm showing you here is gravity wells. Monroe has a degree in physics and used to work at NASA. He understands these theories very well. He drew the gravity wells of the planets. The sun is, in this diagram, the sun is so huge that he didn't have room to show it. It's way down on the left-hand side of the diagram. You can see the inner planets on the left, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Jupiter is massive, so its gravity well is deep. Saturn is also fairly massive. Then there's Uranus and Neptune. You can think of escape velocity as the energy it would take to climb out of these wells. Let's zoom in on Mars. Here you can see the two small moons of Mars, Demos and Phobos. Monroe says that you could climb out of the Demos gravity well with a bicycle and a ramp. On Phobos, you could literally throw a baseball into orbit. Here's the Earth. You can see the satellite regimes, low Earth orbit where the ISS is, that's the International Space Station, medium Earth orbit where GPS is, and geosynchronous orbit. In order to get to the moon, astronauts had to climb out of the steepest part of the Earth gravity well and then go back down to the moon. They needed a huge Saturn rocket to get out of the Earth well. To get back to Earth, all they needed was a small rocket to climb the, the moon's gravity well. Much easier feat. And from there, the way home was downhill. We derived the formula for escape velocity. It's the square root of 2gm over r. The escape velocity for an object at the surface of the Earth is 11.19 kilometers per second. What if the escape velocity were 299,792.458 kilometers per second? That's the speed of light. Nothing can go the speed of light except electromagnetic waves. This is an escape velocity that can never be reached. Here's an equation with this hypothetical escape velocity. Let's square both sides so we can get rid of the radical. And then let's express this in terms of the radius r. Any mass of, mass of objects that is less than this radius will require an escape velocity at the surface that's greater than the speed of light. And nothing can go the speed of light. If we consider the mass of the sun, the radius r would be 3 kilometers. If we were to compress the mass of the sun into a sphere that was 3 kilometers in radius, then the escape velocity at the surface would be c, the speed of light. Here's what we get for the Earth mass. If we were to compress an Earth mass into a sphere with a 9 millimeter radius, then the escape velocity would also be c, the speed of light. This radius is called the Schwarzschild radius. 
More massive objects have a larger Schwarzschild radius. Less massive ones have a smaller radius. The Schwarzschild radius is the demarcation where an event horizon forms. If you go inside it, you will never get out since you cannot exceed the speed of light. Any electromagnetic radiation will be trapped too. This is the formal definition of a black hole. Anything that goes in will never come out. Because of the event horizon, a black hole looks like a void. It does, however, have properties and structure. Black holes do not vacuum up matter. If the sun were compressed down to a 3 kilometer radius sphere, the planets would still remain in their elliptical orbits. Black holes only consume matter that, that is on a collision course. Imagine you're at the event horizon of a black hole. The curvature of space-time is a function of 1 over r squared. If the curvature were really intense, or from a Newtonian perspective, if the force of gravity were really intense, the gravity exerted on your feet would be substantially greater than the gravity exerted on your head, so much so that you'd be torn apart. Stephen Hawking calls this spaghettification, because you'd be stretched like a piece of spaghetti. Case one where astronomers have a sense of humor. Gravity attracts matter to matter. The curvature of space-time results in some matter condensing into clumps of matter, bigger clumps of matter. The most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. Here, gaseous hydrogen is dispersed through a wide area in space. Jupiter is referred to as a gas giant because it's mostly hydrogen, about 90%, but it's not really in the form of gas. Jupiter is so massive that the hydrogen gets super compressed in a liquid form. It's a ball of liquid hydrogen at about 10% helium. If more and more hydrogen collects to the point to where you have one or more solar masses, the hydrogen starts fusing into helium. This sets up a thermonuclear reaction. When two hydrogen atoms fuse into helium, the weight of the one helium atom is slightly less than the two hydrogen. Einstein's equation equals mc squared tells you what happens. The small amount of matter is converted into energy by a factor of c, the speed of light, squared. And that's a huge number. This implies that for a small amount of lost matter, there's a tremendous release of energy. At the end of its life, a star that is 1 to 1.4 solar masses will shrink into a white dwarf after the thermonuclear reaction runs out. These stars are very dense but still maintain their atomic structure. Something called electron degeneracy pressure maintains the structure of the star. Electrons are on the outer shell of atoms and don't like to be too close to each other. They also don't like to be too, too close to the nucleus of the atom. This is the fundamental structure that holds up a white dwarf, white dwarf star. A star that is 1.4 to 3 solar masses has so much mass that when the thermonuclear reaction runs out, the electrons and protons collapse into neutrons. The force of gravity with a star this big overcomes electron degeneracy pressure, forcing electrons and protons to merge. It takes tremendous pressure to do this. This results in a neutron star. A neutron star the size of the Earth has the density of the Sun. They are very massive objects. Something called neutron degeneracy pressure maintains the structure of neutron stars. If a star has three or more solar masses, it will overcome, eventually, neutron degeneracy pressure. And after the thermonuclear reaction runs out, it will collapse into a black hole. We have no way of what's going on within a black hole. Many assume that matter within collapses into a singularity. The 1.4 solar mass limit is called the Chandrasekhar limit, named after the person who discovered it. At the center of our Milky Way, there's a supermassive black hole. At the beginning of this course, I told you that satellites in space can get unobstructed views of infrared and X-ray radiation. There's a lot of dust in the Milky Way. Infrared radiation penetrates dust, but doesn't penetrate our atmosphere. Space-based infrared sensors determine that there's a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. It was discovered based on the highly elliptical orbits of very large stars around the center of the galaxy. Something else very bizarre was discovered about our galaxy. Look at the graph on the right. The dotted line is the expected rotation curve for objects in a galaxy based on Kepler's third law. Now look at the graph above it. That's the rotation curve based on observations. The rotation curve of galaxies doesn't appear to be following Kepler's third law that states that the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. Astronomers were vexed by this. Rather than modify Kepler's third law, they believe that there's matter in the galaxy that we can't see. They've dubbed this dark matter. There are two competing theories. 
One has it that there are massive astrophysical compact halo objects. A halo is a ring of matter that surrounds the galaxy. Another is that there are weakly interacting massive particles. The first are referred to as machos, the second are referred to as wimps. Case two and three where modern day astronomers have a sense of humor.